going to start over Okay, so welcome you all to uh, today's lecture, uh, which happens to be an online lecture, sorry, a physical lecture after a long time. Uh, so what I'm doing today is uh, I'll take this uh, lecture on an experimental basis. And depending on how the recording comes, uh, then we can continue. I'll let you know once I've seen the recording, I'll let you know whether on Monday I'll have an online lecture or offline. So today uh, we can discuss uh, some of the doubts you, which you might have uh, from uh, the portion done before MITSEM or uh, even on a few of the things which we did in the last couple of lectures, uh, which was about testing of hypothesis. Uh, anything you want to uh, discuss? Any question you have or? Right. Uh, I don't have, so you tell me what, what, the, what page five says, yeah. Uh, I mean, what is the canonical form of a PDF? A joint PDF? Uh, joint PDF? Yes. So you see, uh, what you uh, uh, do is, let me exactly see what uh, you are referring to, so that... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so canonical form is, when I write down my PDF, uh, I'm writing on F theta x or F eta x? X square, right? So this is same as e to power summation eta i theta, right? This type, and ti x, right? Minus b. Minus b theta, right? That has to be normalizing constant, b theta. The times sorry. Yeah, so that, that's x. Now, I write down this in such a way, such that this parameter theta, that reparameterization I do in such a way, such that this statistics which is occurring over here, its mean is theta. Right? So reparameterization is done in such a way, so that the mean of theta ix is taken as a parameter. Right? So this theta is nothing but expected value of ix. That is what it means. If we write down it in such a way, eta one theta, a two theta, eta k theta, so that this theta is basically a mean of the statistics which is occurring over there, tix. So, for example, in the case of normal, reparameterization is very straightforward. These eta i theta are theta itself because you will get x bar i's and x loop x bar i is theta i. Right? So, eta one theta would be same as theta itself because what happens in the normal case? Now let us look at variance is known, so 1 by root 2 pi to power n e to power minus 1 by 2. Suppose variance is 1, right? I want to write down this is in an exponential form, right? So I have to write down this in this form in such a way that theta, the parameter which you are getting, is the expected value of this quantity, right? So let us try to see this, so which is 1 by root 2 pi to power n e to power minus one by two summation x i square can become a part of as x. So it is e to power n x bar, so n x bar by two theta, right? No, there is no two, n x bar by theta, is that okay? And then h x, which is e to power minus summation x i square. Right? This is my, this along with root one root two pi is at x basically. And then there would be e to power minus n theta, this is x bar theta, minus n theta square by two, right? That is b theta, right? So this is your b theta. What is the tx over here? Tx, of course, is not unique. You can take Tx to be x bar. You can take Tx to be summation xi also, whatever you want, right? Doesn't matter. So I take my Tx to be x bar. So my, this theta, my reparameterization has to be done in such a way that the theta is the expected value of x bar. So what is expected value of Tx? So what would be my eta one theta? 
sigma is n theta. Right, so it is, I can write down now like, uh, this density in terms of etas. If you want, you can replace this canonical form f eta x, which is nothing but one by root two pi to power n e to the power minus summation x i square by two. All right, e to power eta one x bar, right? Now you have to write down this b theta. B theta you can write down, it is in terms of etas. If you want, you can write down this b theta also in terms of eta one theta is nothing but eta, theta is nothing but eta one by n. So minus n times theta square is nothing but eta one square by n square. That now everything has been reparameterized in a canonical form in such a way such that this expect loop x bar is theta, right? And I write down everything now in terms of expect loop x bar. That okay? Now this is in a canonical form. Now you can talk about the space of eta ones. Theta was taking any value in the real line. So eta one theta would also take any value in the real line. Right, so eta one, which is your theta. You can call this as a theta star, the parameter space for eta. Is that okay? Uh, you can similarly go for two parameter, right? So both are unknown, suppose. Both are unknown. So my theta is mu and sigma. Let us look at, I can consider sigma to be my parameter. This is standard deviation. So F theta X is how much? One by sigma root two pi to power N, all right? E to power minus one by two sigma square. And then I add all this. So this is summation X i square minus twice mu summation X i plus n mu square. Is that okay? Okay, so you, you can write down this also in terms of e to power minus something, right? So this is same as e to power minus n, one by root two pi to power n anyway is constant that you need not bother about. Then that can be written as e to power minus n log sigma. Is that okay? E to power minus n log sigma. E to power minus summation x i square by two sigma square plus n mu x bar by sigma square. Is that okay? And then uh, minus n mu square by two sigma square, right? Is that okay? I want to write down in this in terms of that canonical form. So I have to identify what would be my T1x and what would be my T2x. As I said, choice of T1x and T2x is not unique. You can always play around with some constant and you can change your T1, you will get something else. So a natural choice here could be X bar and T2x as summation X i square because sigma is unknown. So this will also come into the picture. So I define T1x, T2x as x bar, and it's an x i square. Is that okay? Now note that there is no unique way you define a canonical form. You could have defined this in terms of s square also, right? I could have added and subtracted, for example, when it was summation x i minus mu whole square, I would have added x i minus x bar whole square plus x bar minus mu whole square, and then can play it around with that. Doesn't matter. I look at expected value of this quantity. What is this? Mu and n, uh, that is n times x group x square 
So that is n times sigma square plus mu square. Okay. Now you can write down this as your theta, right? Theta one and theta two. Right? And now you replace back everything in terms of mu and sigma you replace in terms of a theta one and theta two. Right? Then this quantity eta one could be n mu upon sigma square, which would be in terms of a theta one and theta two. So that will determine what is your eta one, theta one, theta two. Right? And so this can be written as in terms of e to power theta one x bar plus eta two, some as an x i square. And eta one and eta two are in terms of the mean of x bar and some as an x i square. Right? That is what the canonical form uh, means, right? Is that clear? Yes, anything? Yeah, anything else? Because it, uh, looking at it looks much better, right? It's very soothing to eyes, right? Rather than consider, uh, taking everything now note that sufficiency, everything will not matter because normally this eta one and eta two, because these parameters theta one and theta two would be linearly independent. That means they would be lying in R2, in an open set in R2. You cannot connect them through a line or a plane. So they would be lying in R2. So then eta one, eta two would also be containing a open set in R2, right? So they would be a part of R2. They would be containing a rectangle of R2. You understand what is the difference between rectangle? You see, when I say, for example, when I explain this, the concept of uh, completeness, and I stated a theorem, which says that, look, if your exponential family, you have like e to power summation eta i t i x, and if this eta one, eta two, eta k contain a k dimensional rectangle in R k, right? So for example, in R two, what it means is, your, the values of eta one, eta two should contain a rectangle. It should not happen that they lie on a plane, which is a line in the case of R2. It should not happen that eta one plus eta two is C. Let us say eta one plus eta two is one. Then I cannot say that T1 and T2 is complete. Okay? Only when, because in this case, the possible values of eta one and eta two are lying on this line. If you look at any this line, this line cannot be contained in any rectangle. Right? Because if you try to control any rectangle, it will just cross away over this, however small it is. There'll be points outside this. If you consider any rectangle, there'll be points outside this line, which will not be a part of that rectangle. And here, eta one, eta two are related, which is equivalent to saying that they're linearly dependent. Right? So the parameters should be, when I say that they contain an open rectangle in R2 or open rectangle in RK, that means they are linearly independent in k-dimensional equilibrium space. They cannot be a part of any plane in k-dimensional equilibrium space. In R2, they cannot be part of a line. Is that okay? Okay. Sir, anybody? I could not understand this point. Yeah, anybody is yeah. anybody's asking from here? Okay. Yes, any? sir, I could not, could not understand the last point that you said. Uh, which, were the, which one you couldn't understand? Sir, uh, uh, like they'll be independent in the plane. Linearly independent, right? Linearly independent, yes. I could okay. not understand. You see, linearly independent means there is no linear relationship between the two. Here there is a linear relationship between eta one and eta two. So they are linearly dependent. Now you must have done your matrix theory course. What it says is, I will say, I will call points Excellent. Sir, I, I understand what uh, independence is, linear independence is, but I could not under, I cannot understand why it will hold in this case that we're exploring right now. Because if it is, uh, what is the geometric, uh, geometrical interpretation of vectors being linearly independent? That means they are part of a, some plane in R2, right? For example, in case of R2, that means they are a part of a, some line. Right? These vectors are part of a, some line. So when I say that, these vector points are linearly independent in R, let us say R2 even. Right. Actually, the two things are interchangeable. 
when you I say that they are uh, linearly independent, and they say that. Sir, continue. what do you mean by they will be part of some line? See, for example, there is a possibility that when you are writing down your uh, uh, this PDF in canonical form. You get eta one, eta two. Let us look at the example of I think better example would be. Let us look at the example of a multinomial distribution, right? Okay. Okay. So let us look at. So binomial is a particular case of a multinomial. So let me explain it through binomial, and then you can easily go through it to the multinomial. You see, binomial distribution can be considered as a three-parameter distribution or a two-parameter distribution. Depending on how you write it down. So, for example, I can write down f theta x. So, suppose n is known, then it will be either a one-parameter distribution or a two-parameter distribution. And why? I'll tell you. So, it it for uh, theta power x one minus theta power n minus x. Is that okay? If you have a sample, then it would be summation x i and so on, right? So, let us look at binomial. One theta, so it is summation x i, and then n minus x i. Is it okay? Now this, I can consider theta one and theta two to be two different parameters, and there is a relationship between theta one and theta two, which is theta one plus theta two is equal to one, right? So I consider this as this will be product i is equal to one to n. So this is same as product i is equal to one to n. And choose x i. There'll be an indicator function. This is for when x i is between zero and one. Then indicator function that each x i takes value zero and one, right? And then this I can write down as e to power summation x i log theta one. Right, then e to power one minus theta to the power n I can write down as e to power n log one minus theta, which is a part of your b theta, and then minus summation x i log one minus theta, right, which I can write down as log of theta two. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, summation x i or n minus summation x i. You can uh, let us write down n minus summation x i log theta. Right. It is in that form, exponential form, which we have been discussing. By that theorem, summation x i and n minus summation x i, which are related in this case, so it is not. Uh, that important, they would form a complete sufficient statistic, provided log theta one and log theta two contain a k-dimensional two-dimensional rectangle. But log theta one and log theta two are related, right? Because theta two is same as one minus theta, right? Theta one is theta, and theta two is one minus theta, right? So theta one is. Uh, what are you saying? Yeah, that zero to one. X i can take a value zero and one, right? Because I've considered binomial one theta distribution. Is that okay now? Is that clear? Binomial one theta. So you have a sample density of binomial one theta is one c x i theta to power x i one minus theta to power one minus x i. So it becomes this. Now, in this case, this theta one and theta two are not linearly independent because they are related through some relationship, right? And they will not contain a k dimensional because the relations between what is the relations between theta and theta two? They are lying on a line in this case. You see, it doesn't have to lie uh, on a line. It could be a part of a curve also. If you consider any curve in R two, it does not contain any rectangle, right? Because there is a possibility that your theta one and theta two. Are related through this. So, if your parameter space is such that theta one, theta two are part of this line or this curve itself, then they do not do not contain any rectangle in R two. So, 
your that theorem, which is for exponential family, is not applicable over here. Does that make sense? So it is linearly independent in that sense. So, but but what it means is, if you consider c c one theta one plus c two theta two is equal to zero, then that would imply that c one is zero and c two is equal to zero for every theta one. Is that okay? Anything else? Uh, anybody has? So, for example, if you look at uh, yeah, so let us look at. Uh, to make this further clear, I can consider the example. Let's look at example x1, x2, xn, iid normal theta theta, where theta is positive, right? What would be the density over here, joint density, f theta x? One by root theta, right? Root two pi theta. So one by root two pi theta to power n e to power minus one by two theta. Uh, let me put theta square just to make it things ready. So then it will become one over root two pi theta. Theta is suppose positive, right? e to power minus one by two theta square, summation xi square minus two theta. Plus n theta square. Okay. Which is same as uh, uh, one by root two pi to power n, this can become hx. Then e to power minus n log theta, which can become a part of b theta. And this and this, uh, uh, what does that give? e to power minus n by two. That can also become a part of hx, e to power minus n log theta, e to power minus summation xi square by two theta square e to power, this also becomes, let us say, nx bar, 2, 2 gets canceled, nx bar by theta. Is that okay? I can call this as, this is all hx and bx part, hx and b e to power minus b theta part. This I can write down that as e to power eta one x bar plus eta two, some is an exercise square, right? Where eta is n by theta, and what is eta two? Is one by two theta square, minus one by two theta square. So here you can see your eta two is some c times eta one square. Right? Eta two is some constant time. This is what the relationship you get. Now, if I have to apply that result for exponential family, what should be ensured? That the values of eta two, eta one and eta two should contain a rectangle. But here, eta one and eta two are related through a curve. So they would be a lying in a curve. So here eta one and eta two, because eta one would be c to eta two is basically some c times eta one square, right? Because theta square is c times, c, times c times eta one square, yeah. Whatever it is, right? C times eta one square. Is that okay? Eta one positive, right? Uh, because eta one is n by theta. Theta one is positive. So it will be this kind of a curve, eta one and eta two. So if I have to use that exponential result, I cannot conclude that x bar and summation xi square are complete. Is that okay? I cannot use that result to conclude that x bar and summation xi square is complete because 
by that result, x bar and summation xi square would be complete only when this eta one and eta two, the set of possible values of eta one and eta two, contain a rectangle, which is not the case over here. They are just lying on a curve. However small rectangle you take, that would go out of this curve. Right? There will be some element which will go out of this curve. So yeah, so that uh, uh, result in that sense is uh, important. You have to be careful uh, under what conditions you can use that result, right? Yes, anything else anybody has? Okay, let us do this. Oh, you don't, if you don't have anything on estimation, then I can just uh, devote some time on uh, concepts of hypothesis testing because uh, you, yeah. Uh, uniqueness of uh, uh, what was the uh, uh, where do you have a problem? Where do you have a problem? So you see, let us let us, yeah. So let us try to understand what does name and Pearson lemma says. So first try to understand what is, what is the problem? I have a sample, X, the data, which will be available to you. I have to test H naught, that F is same as F zero against F is same as F one. F zero and F one are known PDFs or known probability mass functions, right? For example, F zero could be normal zero one, and F0, F1 could be normal 1, 1. They're completely specified PDFs and known to you. So I'm testing simple hypothesis against a simple hypothesis. And what does a simple hypothesis mean? That means under H0, you have only one distribution. A normal 0, 1 is only one distribution, right? It is not uh, because everything is known to you, says. So, and similarly, under H1, F1 is completely known to you. So that is also simple. I have to test this. What does the and PSN lemma says? There exists a UMP alpha test, right? That is what it talks about, the existence of a UMP alpha test. Now, in this case, it will be called MP alpha test because uniformly doesn't make sense because there's only one alternative under H0. So that is why you will I'll interchangeably use this as an MP alpha test. UMP alpha test I'll use only when alternative hypothesis has more than one distribution. Then only I'm uniformly minimizing the power, right? Otherwise, I'm just minimizing a power at one point, whatever that alternative hypothesis is. Then, so what it says is there exists a test of the type of the following type, phi star x, which is one, if f1x is greater than c times f0 x, gamma, and zero, if f1x is less than c times f0 x, where c and gamma are chosen, so that now c is equal to infinity is allowed, right? One has to understand I'm allowing c is equal to infinity also. Uh -huh. Such that expected value of under F0 of phi star x. Is same as R. Is that okay? That proof is clear to you? Okay. So it says there is a UMP alpha test. But it says now it asks, now suppose there is a UMP alpha test, does it have to be all the time of this type? The answer is partly yes. It can only differ in this region. So the second part says uniqueness in certain sense that if phi double star 
is most powerful alpha test then phi double star x has to be same as one times if f1 x is less than c times f0 x and zero if f1 x is greater than c times f0 x. That is what it means. So that means it can differ from this test only at the reason f1 x equal to c times f0 x. Otherwise, the two tests would be same. That is what it means. So what is your uh, doubt in this? A is collection of all those x's as that phi star x minus phi double star x. Yeah, is not equal to zero. Okay. F one x. Both are satisfied, right? So first of all, note that to show this, what I have to show. If for any x, phi star is not this, what does that mean? That means this would be unique if phi double star is same as this phi star. If it is not same, this would differ only on the reason f one x not equal to c times f not x. So that means this would differ only when either phi star x is same. What is its complement? What is a complement? Collection of all those x's says that either phi star x is same as phi double star x or f one x is same c times f not x. And that is what you need to show. Hey, so you need to show that that whole weight is on the A complement, right? That is what you need to show. And that is what I have tried to show that, right? Because I first looked into the integral over whole delta of delta x, right? So I defined again delta x as phi star x minus phi double star x into f1 x minus c times f not x, right? That is what I have defined, right? Now, what happens to delta x on set A? It is non-zero, right? And on A complement, this is zero, right? Then I look at what is the integral over delta x, integral of whole space of delta x, right? dx. Now in the discrete case, it would be a summation. This is same as integral over phi star x minus phi double star x into f1 x minus c times f not x dx. Is that okay? First, I consider the first term, which is only with f1 x. With f1 x integral of phi star minus phi double star would be how much? Both are UMP alpha test. Phi star and phi double star are both UMP alpha test because phi star you have already proved in the first part and phi double star you are saying that it is a UMP alpha test. So first part would be zero because if they are both UMP alpha test, they should have a same power, right? They have a same power. That means integral of power comes under f1, right? That means integral of phi star f1 would be same as integral over phi double star f1. So that is why the first part would be zero. So it would be same as minus c times integral over phi star minus phi double star into f0 x dx. Is that okay? This is same as minus c times, what is the integral over phi star f0 dx?
alpha. What is integral over phi double star f zero x? It has a level alpha test, right? So this has to be less than or equal to alpha, right? So there's some quantity less than or equal to alpha. So that means this quantity is always less than or equal to zero, right? Is that clear? Because C is anyway non-negative. Because this is alpha, this is something less than or equal to alpha, so this is positive, and with a negative sign, this would be less than or equal to zero. Now I break this into uh, integral into A and A complement. Under A complement, I know that this is zero. So that means integral over A of delta x would be less than or equal to zero, right? Implies that integral over a of delta x <coughs> is less than or equal to zero. <coughs> what does that mean? That means integral over a f one x minus c times f zero x dx is less than or equal to zero. Uh, sorry, uh, delta x. I have to write down right. F star minus Yeah, that is okay. This is okay. This is okay. But what can you say about this quantity delta x on set A? You see, on set A, f1x is not equal to c times f not x. So either f1x is bigger than c times f not x, or it is smaller. So suppose it is bigger. If it is bigger, then this is positive. But you know that for f1x bigger than c times f not x, phi star is always one, and this would be less than or equal to one. So if f1x is greater than c times f not x, delta x is always greater than or equal to zero. If f1x is similarly less than c times f not x, then I know that this is negative. And in this case, what is phi star? Zero. It will be something greater. So in either case, delta x would be greater than equal to zero. So that is why what I know is integral over a delta x, that means has to be zero. And I know that this quantity is always greater than or equal to zero. Now, if you have a function whose integral over a set A is zero for every x, what does that mean? That means the set A has to be a negligible set. That means integral over A dx has to be zero. Now, integral over A dx is zero. That means this set is negligible. That means everything is over here. Everything is over here. That means either phi star is same as phi double star s, or if that is not the case, then f1x has to be same as c times f not x. Is that okay? Okay. Any? Yeah. So let me emphasize this point. These two points, understanding name and Pearson lemma is very important. In that case, uh, both phi star and phi double star, c will be the same. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, yeah, same test. Not same test. There could be two different tests. Both are uniformly most powerful. Where they are one and zero, that would be same. If both of them have a reason where they are one and zero, otherwise they may be different. It would be more clear through examples. So one thing is over clear that if this reason f one x equal to c times f zero x that has a probability zero, then your UMP alpha test will always be unique. 
and f one x by f zero x is equal to constant if that probability is zero. Normally, that would be the case when you are talking about a lot of these continuous distribution having the same support, right? Continuous distribution, different support there could be a problem, right? Because still you might, as we'll see. So, for example, normal case there will not be any problem. So let us consider. Yeah, I'll come to that. I take the uniform or uh, uh, the normal case first. Huh? I'll come to, I, I can do both, but you'll be able to appreciate only when you have seen the normal, right? Straightforward, but. So I take our sample size one just to. X is normal, mu one. H naught, you have to test that mu is equal to zero. H one, that mu is equal to one, right? So I consider because my test I know would be, uh, I, I need to consider this factor, which is F one X minus C times F naught X. Basically I have to look at the sign of this quantity, right? Which is same as uh, one by root two pi that can come outside. F one S is e to power minus X minus one whole square by two. minus e to power minus x square by two, c times, is that okay? I can look at e to power minus x square by two comes outside. So two pi, and then how much it becomes? e to power minus two x, so that becomes e to power x. Then e to power minus one by two. Minus c, right? You can take e to the power minus one by two also outside, and then it becomes c times e to the power one by two, c root two. So this is this quantity. So my UMP alpha. Now note that when this quantity is zero, this quantity would be zero only when the reason is e to power x is same as c times root e. But x is continuous. So e to power x equal to root c root e, that probability would be zero. So in this case, you know that the reason where UMP alpha test can differ has a probability zero. So that means UMP alpha test is going to be unique. Is that okay? So So your phi star x can be either one or zero, depending on whether this is positive or this is negative. This is positive, that means x is greater than log of c root e, which is some other constant d. So this is one if x is less than t, zero if x less than t. And how I determine D? So that probability of rejecting H naught under H naught, X is normal zero one. So that means one minus phi of D is same as alpha. So D is same as phi inverse of one minus alpha. So your phi star X is one if x is greater than phi inverse one minus alpha and zero if x is less than phi inverse one minus alpha. And this is a unique UMP alpha test, right? This is unique. UMP alpha test or MP alpha test. Any any doubts on this? Perfectly fine, nothing, everything was very neat and clean. Now let's come to a tricky situation where I cannot say MP alpha test is unique or not unique, right? 
And that would be the reason where this probability can be different from zero. That means e to power x, this f1x minus c times f0x equal to zero, that probability can be different from zero. So let's consider, I think we did this example uh, yesterday. Uh, I can again repeat it. Yeah, so x1, x2, xn. So let us look at one observation, doesn't matter. Is uniform zero theta. H naught theta is equal to one against theta is equal to two, right? So my uh, F zero X is one. One if X is between zero to one, zero. Otherwise, and F one X is one by two, if X is between zero to two and zero. Is that okay? I have to look at my delta x. That is the key factor. So delta x is f1x minus c times f naught x. Note that my support, the possible values of x can be anything from zero to one union zero to two, which is x between zero to two. Because under f0, you can go zero to one, and under f1, you can go from zero to two. If I take the union, my x possible values is zero to two. So I should only bother about the values of x which lie between zero to two, because all other values have probability zero, either under h zero or h one. So let us consider this quantity. If x is between zero to one, what is this quantity? This is same as one minus c by two. If X is between one and two, what would be this quantity? Yeah, half, right? Just half? I need not bother about these individual points zero and one because probability of those individual points under H naught as well as under H one is zero. Now note that now the situation is tricky. Because one is clearly determined, that means in that region, my phi star should be one because it is half. And you know that phi star has to be one if delta x is positive. That means f1x is greater than c times f1x. But in that region, depending on a choice, it could be zero also and a negative also. Right? Now, suppose it was negative. It was negative, that means my choice of c is greater than two, right? Then it is negative, but if it is negative, then my phi x would be one for x between one to two and zero for x between zero to one. And what would be a size of, what would be a level of that test? It would be a fixed level, right? Probability under H naught of rejecting H naught. That means probability under H naught that X lies between one to two. You see, if, because C is a fixed quantity. So C, I can choose either it is positive or negative. So first thing is, if I choose that this is positive, this is positive, what does that mean? C is less than two. Then here also positive, here also positive, then my phi is always one. And if my phi is always one, what is the possible level alpha? What would be extra group phi x? It would be one, because phi x is one, then extra group phi x is one. So under H0 also it would be one. So level has to be same as a one which is of no use because my level will have normally small quantity between zero to one. So this positive will not do. If it was negative, then that means my phi x is one if x lies between one to two and zero if it lies between x to zero to one. So what would be expected of phi x? Probability that x lies between one to two. What would be probability x lies between one to two under h naught? Zero level would be zero. So that means I don't have much choices of C available with me. My C has to be, right? C I can take to be two, right? And in that case, what does my test becomes? So I take C to be two, 
in which case, because other choices of C does not give me a UMPL for test, right? So the only choice of C is C is equal to two, which is zero, X between zero to one, and one by two, if X between one to two. So what would be my phi X? In this case, it can be anything gamma when f1 x equal to c times f0x. So gamma, if x lies between zero to one, and one by uh, and one, if x lies between one to two. This could be a one uniformly most powerful test. But note that, huh? This one. This one. Because you see, what, what is the form of your UMP alpha test? Half minus C, F1X minus, F1X is one by two. Yeah, it doesn't matter. In either case, C has to be half, right? That would be the only thing. Yes, yeah, thanks for pointing it out. You see, your UMP alpha test, what it was saying, it should be one if delta X is positive. Zero, sorry, gamma if delta x is zero. And zero if delta x is less than zero. What is this situation? When I'm taking c to be half, that is the only possibility. That means my delta is zero. And at a delta is equal to zero, my phi has to be gamma, right? Is that clear? Now you can determine gamma so that size is alpha. So that means what you have to do is gamma times pro t under h naught, x lies between zero to one, plus pro t under h naught, that x lies between one to two, should be alpha. Pro t under h naught, that x lies between one to two is how much? Zero. So that means gamma has to, and under h naught, x lying between zero to one is one. So that means gamma is same as alpha. Can you conclude that this is the unique UMPL for test? No, because in that reason, this is a reason where the test can differ. Is that okay? So yeah, so let me, so you will see that you can have many more UMPL for test in this situation. In fact, I can, I can, I can shift some of this reason over here so try to find out some other UMP alpha test in this situation. This one UMP alpha test, try to find out other UMP alpha test. Can you find other UMP alpha test in this case? And that is the reason in which you can play around, which is the clear reason X between zero to one. In reason x, so what we can do is in reason x to zero to one, what you can do is from c to one, you can take it to one and zero to c, you can make it to zero. I can always change that and then I can determine c so that size is level is alpha. And you'll see that that has the same power as this. So I, what I would say is my intuition suggests that I can consider phi double star, which is, I don't want to put gamma over here. I say that it is zero, zero less than X less than C. And one, if X is greater than C less than two and C is between zero to one, right? Because I can change thing over here. I make some of them gammas to be one and I make a part of gamma to be zero. Because there, that, that, there is a place where I can change my test. And now I choose this C so that size is alpha, level is alpha. Compute the power of that test. You'll see that power of that test is same as the power of this test. So you can get a lot many, at least one more UMP alpha test. Is that okay? Okay, so let me stop over here. So I'll see the recordings over here. You also give me the feedback. Once I upload this uh, today's recording, give me the feedback whether it was okay. If it was okay, then we can uh, meet for physical classrooms from Monday onwards, okay? Yeah, so thanks.